thanks to um, OIS for allowing us to speak today about um, the latest with Azura Ophthalmics. Um, we like to describe we're taking a dermatological approach to treat ocular surface disease. Um, our focus really is on uh, lid margin disease and our lead indication that we're developing products for is meibomian gland dysfunction. And that's very different in our opinion to dry eye. So our focus, as I said, is meibomian gland dysfunction. Our lead compound, uh, AZR MD001, is a patient administered keratolytic to address the hyperkeratinization at the lid margin. We also have in development an office-based uh, potent keratolytic, which would be physician administered, as well as some proof of concept studies that we're looking at to see whether um, a keratolytic ha has a benefit on uh, contact lens discomfort and uh, the keratinization of material on the lid, uh, lid wiper epitheliopathy. We have other um, new chemical entities that we're developing that um, we're essentially building chemicals from scratch that have keratolytic properties but also have other properties such as uh, anti-inflammatory or antibacterial properties. Um, as we all know, meibomian glands and sebaceous glands come embryonically from the same source. Um, meibomian gland dysfunction is really a, a disease where you have blocked glands, orifices, as well as um, you know, poor lipid quality. At the end of the day, meibomian gland dysfunction is a key contributor to evaporative dry eye. And even in those patients with aqueous and inflammatory dry eye, um, Meibomian gland dysfunction is a key contributor to uh, or and an underlying comorbidity associated with dry eye disease. The way we've looked at devel our development is to take a lot of learnings from the use of keratolytics in dermatology. Um, and there are a lot of similarities between uh, conditions such as comedonal acne or closed comedones or even conditions such as kerato keratosis pilaris. And so you have a process in the skin where you get an overproduction of um, corneocytes and, so, uh, and subsequent blockages. And so when you start to think about the images and the blockages, there's a lot of similarities to that with meibomian gland dysfunction. So in our mind, meibomian gland dysfunction is a condition of blocked or orifices, um, a change in the quality of the lipid or thick lipids, and then that results in lipid deficiency. As I said, meibomian glands and sebaceous glands come, embryonically come from the same source. So it's only natural for us to think about other keratolytics that are utilised for dermatological conditions um, and to see whether they've got any application to treat meibomian gland dysfunction. What's interesting is that, you know, I suppose the world in dry eye has very much been focused on um, the role of inflammation. Um, in 2011, during the international uh, workshop on meibomian gland dysfunction, um, there was a, a strong focus and bringing together a lot of the work that's been done that really focuses on the pathophysiology. So 2011 um, it clearly demonstrated that uh, hyperkeratinization of the gland orifice is present, but probably what is not as well discussed is actually the role of keratin and keratin proteins in the meibom itself. Back in 1991, there were publications that highlighted in both normal meibom and abnormal meibom, there are keratin uh, proteins. And these keratin filaments form disulfide bonds, which actually changes the consistency. And it's almost like change, uh, causing a lattice uh, a meshwork, um, which then changes the quality of the meibom. So we're targeting both the orifice and also the, the uh, uh, poor quality meibom. So there are a couple of ways in which we can try to do, attack this, obviously through energy or heat, um, but one of the challenges with disulfide bonds is that you need about 144 degrees Celsius to break a disulfide bond, or the approach from a pharmaceutical perspective is addressing it chemically. So our lead compound, selenium disulfide, has a really interesting mechanism of action. It was first developed in the 1950s to treat seborrheic uh, dermatitis. But one of the things that people complain about its use in the scalp is that it increases lipid production. And that's one of the reasons why it was also never developed as a uh, treatment for acne vulgaris. It's a keratostatic agent, so it slows down the cell cycle uh, and then therefore future deposition of keratinocytes. And it's a very potent um, breaker of disulfide bonds and therefore loosen the uh, keratin filaments and the plugs at the gland orifice. So we've shown in, um, in both in vivo and ex vivo models that it's uh, uh, a keratostatic uh, 
as well as also showing that it's a keratolytic in breaking down disulfide bonds. Um, what hasn't been published before is the mechanism of action by which it actually is lipogenic, and we've demonstrated in a 3D cellular model where we can increase the lipid production from uh, sebocytes by about 200%, both with our lead compound in selenium disulfide as well as other backup compounds that we have. So our first approach was to do a small proof of concept study um, with a non-ophthalmic formulation where we um, tried to see whether we had the ability to move any of the regulatory endpoints. Um, we saw a six second improvement in tear breakup time after 22 days of bi-weekly administration uh, in the physician's office and also a corresponding improvement in um, uh, myobin quality. Because a lot of these agents don't actually address the, the fundamental underlying basis of the hyperkeratosis, we wanted to see whether we actually, um, um, our drug in this indication replicated what we saw and what we knew about its use in dermatological conditions. And as you can see, once treatment is stopped, it goes back to baseline. So we've developed an ophthalmic formulation. It's an ointment. It's applied to the lower lid margin um, just before patients go to bed. And we're currently in a phase two study uh, across Australia and New Zealand with the results from that study due in the uh, third quarter of this year. Thank you.